Welcome everyone to today's Cultivating Success webinar. Our topic today is organic orchard pest management. Cultivating Success was established in 2000 by University of Idaho Extension, Washington State University Food Systems Program, and the nonprofit organization Rural Roots. This is our fourth season of hosting a webinar series. If you're new to our webinars, just a couple of tips. We're all sharing a lot of bandwidth, so please close other programs running on your computer if you're having any trouble with sound or speed. You can also type into the chat box, which you'll find in the control bar at the bottom of your screen. And myself and Mackenzie Lawrence, my colleague, will help you with technical assistance. At any time during the presentation, you can type questions for Kyle, our speaker, into the Q&A box. So when you look at your control bar, there are two places that you can type. One is a Q&A box that helps us keep track of the questions that have come in, make sure that they can be answered. So we'd like your questions to go there if possible. And then the chat box, please use that for any type of technical assistance. This webinar is being recorded and a slide handout and the recording will be available tomorrow on the Cultivating Success website. So I wanna introduce Kyle Nagy, who is the Superintendent and Orchard Operations Manager at University of Idaho Sandpoint Organic Agriculture Center. And he's located, of course, in beautiful Sandpoint on an amazing research and education facility that we have. So welcome, Kyle. Thank you for being here today. And I wanted to say we really appreciate your sharing information today about organic pest management. For those of you that haven't met me, I'm Colette De Phelps. I'm an area educator in community food systems, and I'm located on the Moscow campus. I'll be providing some technical support today and then facilitating the Q&A. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand the screen over to you, Kyle. All right. So make sure I can get this guy up here. All right, everybody seeing that okay? We're seeing it. Perfect. All right, perfect. Well, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I've uh, been up here in Sandpoint at the Sandpoint Organic Agriculture Center uh, since it was founded. Um, the, uh, the university acquired this property back in August of 2018. And, uh, but I've actually been on the property for 10 years now. So I've been out pruning these trees uh, for the last decade. Uh, which seems seems like uh, much shorter than that, but uh, it's been quite the adventure. A um, little bit about uh, SOAC. Um, we're USDA certified organic. We have about uh, eight acres in orchard production. Uh, we grow uh, 68 different varieties of apples, as well as a handful of uh, pears and plums and some cherries and raspberries as well. Um, the entire property is uh, about 66 acres and it stretches all the way down to those barns at the south end of the property. Uh, we also have a big uh, conference center and uh, dormitories so we can host uh, groups up here for classes and that kind of stuff. But just, just looking at that, it's definitely not a bad place to come to work every day. So uh, I, uh, I'm going to try and cover quite a bit in uh, today's webinar. So if I rush through anything, uh, be sure to uh, ask me some questions uh, if I didn't clarify quite enough, uh, but this is kind of going to be what we're going over today. So uh, degree days uh, and degree day tracking is something that's uh, extremely important for uh, organic uh, pest management. Um, degree day tracking is just based on your high and low temperatures for each day and those days build up and accumulate. Um, and uh, there's different base temperatures or different uh, plant uh, bud phases that uh, we're looking for to start out our de degree day tracking. Um, but the, the key is that, uh, that whichever pest we're tracking, uh, it's not uh, making any uh, physiological development uh, below that base temperature or below that bud stage. Um, so that's kind of uh, what we use to uh, determine when that uh, pest uh, or disease is most vulnerable to being uh, controlled, and uh, then we try and target it in that window. Um, and it, it's definitely uh, quite a bit of work to, to do all the tracking and everything, uh, but it really helps us uh, do less spraying out in the orchard, uh, which is a, a big thing for us. We, we try to be uh, low spray as, as much as possible. 
Um, so bottom right diagram you can see is uh, that's that's the formula for uh, for degree day tracking and uh, each pest or disease is going to have a, a little bit different base temperatures and, and thresholds. Um, so that's something that you can find uh, for each individual uh, pest. Um, the, the four pests at the bottoms are the ones that, uh, that I track uh, degree days for up here in Sandpoint. Um, it's, uh, we actually just had a, a new weather station installed on site by uh, the university uh, last fall. So now we have some really accurate data to, uh, to get this right. So I'm hoping to be able to uh, get that information out uh, to others in this, this Sandpoint area. But being that uh, with all the different microclimates and everything, it's, it's going to be a little bit different. So if you have the ability to uh, track in your uh, area, that's, that's going to give you the best results. So this is just a very busy slide, but this uh, shows you kind of uh, what we're looking at uh, for the four uh, pests that I'm actively tracking with degree days. Um, different uh, have they have different start dates or uh, the the coddling moth and leaf rollers are based on biofix which is when you're uh, getting your first uh, consistent trap of, uh, of, of the uh, the pest in your pheromone traps and then off of that it's uh, based on high and low base temperatures and then uh, we have an idea based on those accumulating temperatures um, how many degree days uh, before we are going to see their first flight or before you're going to hit the, the peak uh, infections period. So uh, that these are it's a lot of information on this page and I'm thinking that uh, Colette is making these slides available. So if anybody wants to come back to this, uh, you're certainly welcome to. So uh, bud stage is, uh, is something, especially in apples, that uh, we're watching pretty closely uh, when it comes to um, to scab especially. Um, the uh, green tips, the top right corner, when we see our first green tips out in the orchard, that's when we first start uh, recording our, uh, our temperatures for degree day tracking for apple scab. Um, other, other reasons to know your bud stages, um, the leaf rollers uh, is uh, one that we're trying to control with uh, BT. Um, and we're trying to get two to three applications of BT between this tight cluster phase number five and petal fall number eight. So it's, uh, it's good to know your, your bud stages to, to, be, to know what you're on the lookout for. So uh, let's get into some uh, orchard insects pests. Um, we have some minor pests and some major pests. And I'm really just gonna go over what I see on a regular basis out in our orchard. Uh, you're going to have different pest pressures in your area. So uh, if you have any questions uh, when we get to that section, uh, let me know. And uh, if it's something I deal with, I might be able to provide some advice. So uh, for minor pests, uh, the pear slug, uh, the red hump caterpillar, and the earwigs are ones that we see pretty consistently every year. Um, but none of them are uh, pests that we're overly concerned about. Uh, the pear slug, uh, the picture down here at the bottom left, um, that's actually a sawfly larva, um, and that's one that uh, we see uh, on it, mostly on pears. We've seen it a little bit on apples, but it seems that they prefer the pears, and they do this uh, skeletonizing damage that you'll see there. Um, usually, uh, they, they don't do a whole lot of damage to fruit. Um, what we're usually doing with these guys is uh, often if I guess the big thing that we do is, is monitoring, consistent monitoring. So we're walking through the orchard, looking for anything that looks a little bit off. So uh, when we see those skeletonized leaves, we'll, we'll take a closer look and, uh, and we try to catch that, uh, those type of infestations early. Um, same with uh, the red humped caterpillars or, or any Lepidoptera species that you're dealing with. Um, just in monitoring, you can see uh, that, that flagging uh, of showing those, those tips defoliated is a pretty obvious sign that you're having some, uh, some pest problems. So uh, when we're doing our monitoring, we're looking at for that kind of stuff. And, uh, and then we're, we're getting on there as fast as we can. And with the pear slugs and the caterpillars, if they're in a confined enough area, they're on a single branch of a, of a few trees, then we, we use uh, physical removal to get rid of them. Uh, I remember the first time I sent a, an intern out there uh, after caterpillars with a pair of gloves and nothing else, 
uh, sh they were a little disgusted, but uh, it's, it's an organic way to uh, get rid of this pest without having to spray anything. And it's, it's gonna be the fastest thing you can do as well because you can go right through and, and pick all those guys off and just give them a pinch and, and you're done. Uh, the, the earwigs is uh, another one that, uh, that we're uh, on the lookout for. Um, the earwigs tend not to do any damage themselves, but uh, they tend to uh, find damage that other pests have started and, uh, and then they do their damage. Uh, so you can see this top right corner, uh, it was probably had a, a boring insect uh, got into that fruit, uh, like this one down in the bottom. And you can see that, that little uh, earwig tail just sticking out. Um, and uh, don't tend to do a whole lot on their own, but they will take advantage of uh, wounds in the fruit uh, from, from other uh, pests. Uh, something that we do for the earwigs is uh, we, we band our trees with uh, corrugated cardboard. Um, and just usually uh, maybe like a three inch wide strip of corrugated. So uh, they have those tunnels to go up in as they're climbing up the tree. Um, they'll, they'll go in there and uh, they'll just hang out in there. And uh, what we'll do is uh, occasionally go out there and uh, remove them and, uh, and actually burn the cardboard then to, to get rid of them. And uh, we usually just wrap a, a single band of cardboard around there, fasten it with some electrical tape and, uh, and then they, they usually fill in there quite, quite a bit. Uh, the earwigs tend to do most of their uh, predation uh, at night. Um, so uh, they're usually looking for this shelter during the day um, is when they're really gonna fill into that cardboard. I've also read that uh, you can uh, moisten your cardboard a little bit because they're, they're looking for a damp, uh, cool area uh, to, to beat the heat of the day. Uh, so that's that's something that we do for for earwigs as well. So on to some major pests, uh, the coddling moth, uh, the one that any anyone who grows apples uh, on any real uh, scale know about, because they are uh, kind of the worst thing we deal with out here. Um, always good to know about the life cycle of the pest you're trying to control. Uh, that's going to help you uh, determine when they're going to be uh, most uh, uh, most sensitive to, to being uh, hit with sprays or, or removed physically. Um, so, so the cowling moth uh, actually overwinters in uh, a cocoon that's either under some loose bark, uh, sometimes they'll be down in the base of the tree in the, in the duff there. Um, the, uh, the, one of the reasons that uh, on these old trees, I'll try and uh, get rid of some of the loose bark that's on them is because that's where a lot of these pests are gonna overwinter is underneath that loose bark. So uh, I, I'm careful not to tear any fresh bark off and open any wounds, but uh, just being able to knock off some of the dead bark uh, can help eliminate some of the overwintering areas for them. Uh, so they, they pupate when, uh, we're, when we're starting to show some uh, pink tips in our, our bud stages and the uh, adults uh, emerge back at, at full bloom of uh, Red Delicious, um, which uh, tends to be uh, late May up here, but uh, we'll, it's, it's going to be a little bit different from, for everybody. Um, so then uh, they, the peak emergence is about uh, three weeks after uh, full bloom, and uh, this is when uh, they're going to really be uh, doing a lot of their damage. Um, they'll, they'll lay eggs pretty quickly, and, uh, and then that first generation incubates um, for, for about two weeks or so, and then the, uh, the larva hatches from there. And uh, that's when you'll see them bore into uh, usually the, the calyx, the, the flower end of the apple. Uh, and then they get inside there, they'll chew on some, some seeds uh, as they're growing, and then they'll move out into the flesh of the apple. Um, and then they, you'll see like this, uh, the pictures over on the right, that's actually uh, a lot of the times where they're uh, exiting the apple, you'll see all that frass coming out of there um, as they're, they're making that hole. And uh, then after they're in that, uh, the, the apple there for a while, they'll uh, drop out and, and spin their cocoon. And uh, then they'll either uh, be under that bark or in that duff at the bottom of the tree uh, over winter, or uh, that will be your second generation. Um, usually we see two generations of uh, coddling moth up here, uh, but I've been told in some areas you can get up to three, uh, three generations in a single season. 
Um, so what we're doing for, for cowling moth is uh, we do some pheromone trapping, and that is uh, to get that biofix, which is a, a key uh, in, in doing our degree day tracking. And then uh, for our degree day tracking, uh, we, we watch that until we get to those, that uh, area that it's, it's making that uh, trip uh, from, the, from, its, uh, from its pupa state going up into the apple. That's when we're trying to catch them. Um, so uh, mating disruption is, is one, of our, uh, one of the big things that we use for coddling moth control. And uh, it doesn't work uh, especially well in, uh, in a small orchard, but it's something that's uh, gaining uh, a lot of popularity and, uh, and having really good, uh, good results uh, in large commercial orchards. Um, started out just as uh, organic, uh, uh, organic production product, but now it's being used by uh, conventional uh, quite widely. Um, and the big thing with mating disruption uh, is you're trying to get them out in the field early and often. So you want them out there before you have any moths flying and you want to have them out there pretty thick because um, the, the pheromone uh, is a, a female pheromone that we're putting out there and we end up putting one in, in almost every tree out in our orchard. Uh, and then uh, as that male is flying around in the evening looking for the female, uh, he's going to keep finding our uh, fake females. Uh, so you end up with some uh, sexually frustrated male moths out in the orchard. Uh, so, so that's uh, one thing that we do for uh, coddling moth. And uh, something else that we're going to be implementing this year is uh, a Cydex, which is a, a granulosis virus spray that, is, uh, that targets specifically the coddling moth. Um, I uh, haven't used this in the past, but it's something that's uh, been getting some good results. Uh, so we decided we'd give it a shot this year. Uh, another uh, major pest that we're dealing with is uh, the leaf roller. And uh, these guys, uh, we're usually looking at the pandemus or the oblique banded uh, leaf roller. You get uh, two generations a year up here. Um, they're another one that's uh, going to overwinter in uh, the cracks and crevices in the bark uh, or around the edge of pruning scars. Um, they, they become active uh, during the bud break where they actually bore into the flower or the leaf bud uh, rather than the coddling moth that's actually waiting for the fruit. Um, and then they, uh, the larva grow and, and pupate mid-May. Um, and then we get that second generation that comes on. Uh, you're, you're probably familiar with the damage from leaf rollers. They're pretty common. You'll see some uh, webbing where they're actually uh, sticking leaves to the surface of the apples and uh, they can make themselves uh, a nice little tent in there that's uh, pretty uh, tough to get any spray in to do any uh, real uh, control of them. So it's, it's key to catch them in that time when they're uh, moving to the flower buds. Uh, that, that's uh, your, your best chance to get them. So this is why we're, we're doing that uh, two to three applications between tight cluster and petal drop phase. Uh, and that's that uh, BT bacillus. Um, and, and that seems to, to work pretty well. Um, it, it's not one that we ever see a, a ton of damage with, uh, but it's something that if you had them in high numbers in your orchard, you could definitely see quite a bit of damage. Um, another one uh, is the Western cherry fruit fly. And this is uh, our, our major pest for our cherries. We have, uh, Let's see four different varieties of cherries out here. Uh, one of our favorites up here is the Lappins cherry. Uh, it's a Bing type variety that uh, actually originated in uh, British Columbia. So it does well in the Pacific Northwest up here. Uh, it tends to be less prone to cracking than, uh, than the Lappin or than the Bing cherries. Um, and, uh, and we've actually found that the, the Bings seem to get a little more bird pressure uh, than, uh, than the Lappins. The Lappins uh, cherries tend to be held a little closer to the branch where uh, they seem to be covered by the leaves a little bit longer uh, than the Bing. So you get a little extra bird protection out of that. Uh, so the Western cherry fruit fly, you get one generation that's, uh, that's really growing quite a bit uh, early June through your uh, harvest period. Um, and uh, it's actually the, the females that are coming and laying the eggs uh, just under the skin of the fruit uh, that are, are doing most of the damage. Uh, then the eggs hatch and feed around in there for a while. And then uh, they drop out uh, to the soil surface uh, where they pupate in that uh, duff and overwinter there. 
Um, the damage is, is pretty evident uh, when, when you see them and you, you bite open and you see uh, half of, a, half of a, uh, a fruit fly worm, you already tasted the good half of it. Um, so uh, monitoring is a, a big thing that uh, we do for, for the Western cherry fruit fly. Uh, we use uh, yellow sticky traps and that's just to get an idea of uh, how bad of an infestation we're gonna have to see if their numbers are really high or if we're having a, a low year. Uh, and then we're also uh, tracking degree days uh, on the Western cherry fly. So uh, for spraying, we're using a spinosad product uh, being certified organic. Uh, we're using a, a product called Entrust, um, which has, has had good results for us. Um, we start tracking our degree days uh, back on March 1st, uh, but it's been pretty uh, cool up here for us so far. So I think so far we've only accumulated like five degree days since the beginning of the month. Uh, so they still have quite a ways to go to get to that uh, 1,066 days. Uh, that we're looking for our first spray at. Uh, and then uh, petal drop is another thing that we're watching for. Uh, if you're not tracking degree days, uh, petal drop is a good time to uh, start uh, spraying for the uh, Western cherry fruit fly. And this is one that on a, it's a seven to 14 day interval that you're spraying from that around petal drop area all the way through harvest. So it's definitely uh, the most intensive spraying we do in the orchard, but uh, it's it's really necessary to uh, control that uh, this pest. Uh, the seven days is if we have a, a big rain event uh, but, uh, shortly after a spray, or uh, the 14 day will will stretch it if it's been nice and and sunny and dry and and all the uh, spinosad is still there doing its work. Um, the last of the major uh, pests, insect pests out in the orchard is uh, the aphids. Uh, I'm sure you've seen aphid damage on uh, the new growth uh, terminal tips on branches. Uh, it starts to, to shrivel up and uh, their, their numbers uh, grow really quickly. Um, we're, we're often concerned about ants when it comes to uh, aphids. Um, if you've watched any videos on YouTube of, of ants uh, herding the aphids around. It's, uh, it's a pretty uh, amazing relationship uh, that, they've, that they've grown. Um, so, so the ants actually make the aphid uh, infestation worst by herding them around to more productive areas uh, and uh, protecting the, the aphids from predators, which is, is pretty wild. Uh, one of the things that we do to, uh, to control the ants, um, they're coming up the tree up and down uh, from the ground and, uh, and taking that honeydew from the aphids and heading back to their, uh, to the, the, the colony. So uh, what we'll do is use tanglefoot around the base of our trees. And uh, tanglefoot is just a very sticky uh, substance. So what we'll do is uh, we'll take some of that like orange flagging tape that you can get at any hardware store and we'll wrap that around the tree uh, and make kind of like a three inch band on the trunk. And we'll try and do it pretty tight so that nothing can squeeze behind that flagging tape and go up the trunk. So make about a three inch wrap with that. And then I'll usually do one wrap with electrical tape around there just to hold it on. And then we'll put a, a thick layer of, uh, of tangle foot on that flagging tape just so it's not on the bark because that stuff is extremely sticky. Um, I'm a big fan of the tanglefoot. It, it really does a lot to control the ants and then it makes your aphid infestation uh, less, less problematic. Um, and the nice thing about tanglefoot is uh, it's, it's a physical barrier. So as soon as you have it on there, you, you can watch it work. You can see the ants come up the tree and, and get stuck in it and they're not going anywhere. Um, that's something that depending on the amount of ant traffic you have going up and down that tree, uh, you may have to replace that occasionally if, uh, if they're just walking over each other. Um, something else we do for aphids, uh, we'll do a dormant oil spray. We do a, a neem oil spray up here uh, during the dormant season. And uh, we, we use neem just early in the season or, or late in the season, but uh, it's too thick of an oil to spray through the heat of the summer. So if we're doing any uh, oil applications midsummer, we're gonna use something lighter like a, a paraffin wax oil. Um, if, uh, if your aphids are, are in a pretty confined area, you can also just use a high pressure water spray uh, to knock them off of the tree. Um, uh, at that stage, they, they don't have uh, wings, so they're not gonna fly back up in the tree or anything. 
it's uh, just going to be that knocking them off the tree and then they won't be able to get back up there. Uh, we brought in some biocontrol in the past uh, for aphids, uh, namely uh, ladybugs and uh, green lacewings. Uh, the lacewings, uh, they, they don't tend to stick around. We haven't built up a, a real uh, local population, um, but the ladybugs uh, tend to, to do a little bit better. Um, this guy on the far uh, top right, that's a, a ladybug larva. Um, and those are the most voracious eaters. So these guys will eat more than the adult phase of, uh, of the ladybug. So if you see any of those guys on your plants, leave them alone, they're the good guys. Um, and uh, in something that we do with the ladybugs, so uh, we get them by the gallon and it's something like 80,000 uh, ladybugs per gallon. And uh, we're trying to get them to stick around in the orchard. So there's a few things we do to try and uh, get them to stay put. Um, we'll put them out in the evening just before dark. So uh, it's not, they don't have all day to just take off and fly around. Uh, we'll wet down some trees, um, which isn't great for, for fungal problems, but uh, these, these uh, ladybugs have been refrigerated. So they're kind of in a dormancy. Uh, so by giving them some water right away, uh, that's gonna be the first thing they're looking for. So they don't have to fly off and, and find that. Um, another thing that we do is uh, once I get the ladybugs, I'll dump them into like a five gallon bucket and I'll uh, just spray them with uh, like a hand spray bottle uh, with a mixture of uh, water and uh, a soda, 7-Up or Pepsi or whatever you have around. And uh, the sugar in there uh, kind of acts as a glue and sticks their, their wings together so they can't take off and fly. So now they're kind of uh, stuck where they're at. Uh, until they, they get some moisture to wash that off of them. So that's uh, one way that we try and get them to uh, stick around a little longer. So uh, they actually do some work in our orchard instead of flying to the neighbor's property. All right, so any questions on degree days or uh, insect pests in the orchard? We do have a couple of questions. Right. And one is, um, whether or not you would be able to provide some pictures, not now, but we could add into the slide deck of the corrugated cardboard around the base of the tree and then the tangle foot on the flagging. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I probably have some pictures of that somewhere. I will uh, get them out to you and, and we'll get those in there, but it's, it's uh, pretty basic. You're just uh, wrapping it around the trunk, trying to create a barrier that those earwigs are gonna have to climb up into um, and then the same with the tangle foot, you're creating that barrier that, uh, that they're not going to be able to cross. Okay, so flush to the, the trunk with the cardboard was one of the questions. And that makes sense if you're creating a habitat for them to stay in. Yeah, yep. Okay, great. And then we had another question about whether or not you could discuss kaolin. I'm wondering if this is... Yeah, so uh, a kale and clay, uh, it's, it's not something that, uh, that we deal with up here, um, but uh, it's, it's used to kind of coat uh, the, the fruit and the bark of the tree to prevent some boring insects. Um, we, uh, we, don't have a, we don't deal with a whole lot of it up here. Um, I've also seen kale and clay used uh, to prevent a sun scald on apples as well. Uh, but uh, up in, in North Idaho, we're, we're happy when we have sunny days. We're, we're, we'll take all we can get. <laughs> all right, thank you. And then a couple of resources for degree days. Do you have a source where people should go to find out um, what the temperatures have been if they haven't been monitoring over the last month? You said you started looking and tracking temperatures in your area on March 1st. So is there a back? a back library of temperatures that people could find? Um, there's, uh, it, it might be worth looking uh, at, at a, your local extension office because they might have uh, the best idea of where the closest weather station is gonna be. Um, but uh, we, uh, we've gotten some information from uh, the folks down on campus before uh, for some uh, degree day tracking. And then uh, also, um, WSU uh, is a, a great resource for a lot of uh, true fruit or tree fruit uh, pest management questions and, uh, and degree day tracking questions. Okay, great. And is that where the base temperature would be found then for different? Yeah, types? I think uh, they would have most of the base temperature information. Um, and uh, but but that's something that that's widely available out there. Okay. 
Great. We will look for some resources to add to the slide handout as well. All right. Sounds good. Okay, great. So those are the questions that we have had come in. All right. Back to you. So next section is uh, minor and major disease pests. Um, so minor disease pests that we see out in the orchard, uh, powdery mildew uh, is, is one we see, but it's, it's not something that's ever a, a big concern for us. Um, the, uh, the black rot and uh, frog eye leaf spot um, are, are part of the same uh, disease. Um, and uh, that's one that uh, we're, we're starting to see a little bit of. Um, we, uh, we're spraying a sulfur spray uh, for apple scab, which I'll get to in a minute here. Um, but uh, those, those early sulfur sprays can help with the uh, black rot and uh, frog eye leaf spot and the powdery mildew. Um, if we're seeing some powdery mildew uh, later in the season, uh, we'll sometimes hit it with a, a paraffin wax oil uh, and that, that can knock it down as well. Um, if you're seeing a lot of the uh, black rot, um, which would be this, uh, uh, your, your bark starting to flake off of your limbs, that type of thing, you're, it's cracking uh, and you're starting to see some of the, the dead wood inside, uh, that, that's a sign that you have some black rot. Um, it can be something that's uh, I think some of, some of the black rot that we've seen in our orchard is uh, actually from uh, mechanical damage uh, with, uh, say, somebody driving the tractor past a tree and you, you scrape a, a branch and then it has that, that open wound there. And I think that that's how some of our uh, black rot has gotten in. Um, it's something that uh, you can prune out. Um, uh, you'll, you'll see the cankers, the sunken uh, dead areas um, that you can get rid of. Um, and another thing that you can spray for the, the black rot, it's uh, something that being certified organic, uh, we uh, have to show that we've taken other steps to try and control it uh, before we use this as it's a restricted uh, uh, input. But uh, there's uh, some copper fungicides uh, that are really good for, for black rot and other uh, fungal diseases. Uh, but it, it's one that uh, we try to avoid uh, as much as possible. Uh, bitter pit is this uh, bottom right hand corner, and that's actually uh, more of a, a post harvest deficiency than anything, uh, but I thought this would be a good place to include it. Um, bitter pit uh, is, is something that uh, can occur in, in most any variety, but there are some varieties that tend to be prone to bitter pit, um, and the biggest one is, is honey crisp. Uh, everybody loves the honey crisp. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, a great apple, but it's not the easiest apple to grow. Um, it does have its uh, own disease problems, uh, and this uh, bitter pit is one of them. So uh, bitter pit is actually caused by a, a calcium deficiency. So uh, by, uh, by doing some foliar applications of calcium uh, while the fruit is, is uh, uh, growing, uh, that's a, a good way to control this. Um, so we're usually trying to do, I'd say around four to five applications of, of calcium, uh, probably uh, mid-June through uh, harvest, uh, usually by the end of August, we're, we're usually done spraying. Um, but uh, by getting that foliar calcium on there, uh, it can definitely help um, uh, alleviate that. So you don't have all these nice apples going into storage and then you go to pull them out and they're starting to look like this. Um, bitter pit's also been tied to, uh, to over fertilization with nitrogen. Uh, so uh, if you're starting to see a lot of bitter pit uh, on varieties other than Honeycrisp that aren't very prone to it, uh, you could possibly be over fertilizing with your nitrogen. Uh, so some major pest uh, or disease pests in the orchard. Uh, apple scab is uh, probably the, the thing we deal with uh, the most uh, up here. Um, and some years aren't as bad as others, but when you have a, a cool wet spring, uh, you're, you're gonna see some, some apple scab out in the orchard. Um, and uh, it's a fungal disease. Uh, so, so that's what we're uh, looking at when we're trying to control it. Um, the, uh, the, the fungus actually overwinters in, uh, in the leaves and, and fallen fruit that are around the base of your trees. Um, and then uh, as uh, temperatures warm up and uh, they start to grow their fruiting bodies, uh, they can be discharged by uh, rain or, or any, uh, anything that physically moves them around, uh, but they need to have that moisture. Um, and then uh, this is when they uh, 
get into your tree and then they you'll see the uh, the patches on the trees and that's uh, what's going to produce your secondary infection and uh, it's all based on on moisture so it needs that moisture to uh, to really take hold and, and do its damage um, so you'll you you're probably familiar with uh, apple scab on on leaves and, and fruit um, it doesn't tend to affect the, the, the flavor of the fruit unless it's a, a really severe infection where you can see uh, in the bottom right corner, we're getting some cracking uh, associated with the scab there. Um, but most of the time, uh, if, if we don't have any of this cracking on our apples, uh, we usually, they, they're still good apples. We, we usually throw them in cider um, because people don't like to look at scab. Either that or, or I'll eat the, the scabby ones. That's fine with me. Um, so uh, for, for control, uh, big thing is, is sanitation and, uh, and correct pruning. So sanitation is uh, mostly just trying to uh, collect any of that, uh, the fallen fruit and fallen leaves and try and get that out of your orchard since that's going to be your inoculum for, for the next year. Um, being a, a large orchard with uh, over 640 trees, uh, we're not able to to collect all of our leaves. Um, so uh, what we like to do is after uh, all of our leaves that are on the ground, we try and do a, a really short mowing through the orchard to really chop all that stuff up and help it break down as fast as possible. Um, depending on uh, your soil pH, you can also do a light uh, surface lime application uh, and that will also help uh, to get everything to decompose a little bit faster so you wouldn't have as much of that uh, inoculum uh, sitting there in the spring. Um, then pruning is the other big thing. Um, so uh, when we're pruning our trees, uh, most of our apple trees are pruned to a, a central leader with scaffolding branching. And uh, it's, it's really important to, to give a lot of room between your layers of scaffolding branches. Uh, we're looking for a really airy open canopy. Um, and uh, the reason for that is if you have good uh, light penetration into your canopy and good air uh, circulating through the canopy, uh, your, your leaf surfaces are going to uh, dry off uh, a lot faster than if it's a thick uh, shaded uh, inner canopy. Um, and since it needs that moisture um, uh, to, to reproduce and, and to spread, um, that's, uh, that's, uh, it's a good thing to, to keep that airy canopy so that it doesn't have moisture sitting in there um, for all day long, because um, that's when you're gonna see some damage. Um, so we do degree day tracking and uh, we're, we're looking at, uh, we start, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, at that green tips bud stage. Uh, we'll start recording our degree days and, uh, and then from there, um, it's that window between 300 cumulative degree days and 700 that uh, we're at an accelerated uh, phase uh, for infection. So that's when we're really concentrating our sprays We'll try and get uh, our first sulfur spray out there uh, soon after we hit that uh, 300 hour or degree day mark or uh, potentially just before it if uh, we see some rain events coming up. Um, and then we'll spray on that seven to 14 day interval until we hit that 700 degree days. Uh, being certified organic, we're, uh, we're, we're trying to really think about uh, our pollinators as well. Uh, so as soon as we get into full bloom, we, we stop spraying completely. Uh, we want those pollinators to be able to do their work uninterrupted. Uh, and it, it may cost us a little bit of extra scab, but it's, it's something that we're, we're willing to do. Um, and then uh, depending on where your degree days are lining up, uh, sometimes we'll do uh, an, a final sulfur application after petal drop, where uh, if, if we're still in that under that 700 day uh, degree day window. Um, and uh, we're using sulfur because uh, the micronized sulfur uh, specifically are the tiniest particles of sulfur you can get. And when you spray them in a the solution, they get down into all the nooks and crannies in the bark, uh, which is where that uh, the scab wants to take hold. Um, so by getting the sulfur down into those nooks and crannies uh, as the water evaporates, that sulfur is left there. So then next time you get a rain event where that little cranny is getting filled with water, that sulfur is affecting the pH of the water, and that makes it so that uh, the, the scab uh, fungus can't, uh, can't actively uh, reproduce and spread. 
The other uh, big uh, orchard disease pest we're looking at is, is fire blight. And uh, this is one that's uh, really scary in a certified organic setting. Uh, there's not a whole lot of, of, of sprays that we can use that, uh, uh, that are allowed for organic uh, production. We do have uh, one uh, product that we keep on hand in case we need it, but we haven't had to use it yet. And that is a, a product called uh, Serenade. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, something that we, we haven't had to use yet, um, but uh, it's, it's something that we want to have in case we need it. So uh, the uh, fire blight is a bacterial disease and uh, it'll overwinter at the edge of uh, cankers, those sunken uh, dying areas on the branches. And uh, once it warms up, they'll begin to ooze this, uh, this usually clear to amber bacterial ooze. Um, and then this uh, bacterial ooze can then be spread uh, by, by raindrops splashing it or uh, by insects landing on it and then going and visiting other trees, other flowers, that type of thing. Um, and, uh, and fire blight actually has the ability to stay dormant in your orchard um, until uh, the conditions are just right for it to, uh, to take hold and, and really cause some damage. So again, uh, monitoring is a big thing out in the orchard. Um, what we're looking for this top right corner is, uh, is a telltale sign of fire blight that's called the, the shepherd's crook. Um, and, uh, and that's something that we're, we're really on the lookout for. Um, you can also have it where it'll just uh, infect the, the blossoms, uh, where you'll see the, the blossoms or the, the fruit set will actually shrivel up and turn black. Um, and uh, the worst thing you would see is, uh, is a, a scorch tree, as you'll see in the bottom right, where you have uh, a lot of uh, infection in there, uh, in the larger uh, main scaffolding limbs and even getting into the trunk. So uh, for fire blight, uh, one of the best things you can do is, is look for resistant varieties, um, because that's uh, gonna be your best bet to avoid fire blight overall. Um, some off the top of my head, uh, Freedom is a, a good one that's uh, very resistant. Um, I believe Macintosh, uh, Enterprise, uh, Empire are all uh, good resistant varieties. Um, and maybe more important than looking for the least or, or most resistant variety is uh, look at which varieties are the most prone to the infection and to try and avoid those varieties. Um, there's a, uh, it's uh, similar to, to degree day tracking. There's uh, some predictive models uh, that are, have uh, come out for uh, fire blight. Uh, WSU has, uh, I think it's uh, Cougar Blight uh, is, is the name of their program for, for tracking uh, uh, the fire blight. Uh, and it has a lot to do with uh, leaf wetness and uh, high and low temperatures. So they're, what they're doing is after a rain event, they're actually monitoring their leaves to see how long those uh, leaves have moisture on them because that's a, a way of determining uh, the probability of infection. Um, so you can definitely look up their uh, model uh, for prediction. Uh, it's one that you, I don't even think you need to have a, a computer to do it. You can do it by hand. Um, I haven't gotten into that yet, uh, but we haven't had uh, fire blight be a big problem here. Um, we've had, uh, we had one uh, tree uh, really in the middle of our orchard that uh, we saw it on early, um, but it was uh, fairly low on a scaffolding branch. Uh, so uh, we, we tried to prune it out, uh, but we were unable to. Uh, so we actually removed the tree just to, just to get rid of that inoculum because we do not want to risk uh, having fire blight run through the orchard up here. Uh, so this is another one that, uh, that uh, over fertilization with nitrogen uh, can uh, cause or can be part of uh, what contributes to fire blight. Um, sanitation is a big thing um, with, with pruning or, or anything that you're doing out in the orchard. We're always sanitizing our tools uh, between trees so that uh, we're not spreading disease from one tree to the next that we're moving to down the line. Um, we, we like to use a, a rubbing alcohol as, uh, as our sanitizer. Um, we usually use uh, the, the like 99% and diluted to around uh, like 75% or so. 
and that seems to work well. Um, uh, you can also use uh, Lysol or Pine Sol are supposed to be good for, for sanitizing uh, pruning tools, uh, but try to avoid using bleach uh, as bleach is really hard on tools. It causes pitting in metal, uh, which is, makes it harder to clean and more places for, uh, for disease to, to hold and then you're, you're spreading it to your next tree there. And then also uh, debris in the orchard. We try and get rid of all of our big prunings uh, or anything that uh, if, we, if we saw some fire blight and we pruned it out, we get rid of that immediately and try and uh, burn it as, as fast as possible or, or get it off site to an area that it's not gonna be uh, causing other people headaches as well. Um, and uh, I had mentioned trying to prune out uh, the infection. Um, that's something that's definitely possible. Uh, with the shoot blight or uh, the blossom blight, but it's uh, much more difficult when you get it into the structural limbs and the trunk of the tree. Uh, what we're usually trying to do is uh, we look for the lowest point of infection on a, a limb uh, and we're trying, we cut back a foot below that uh, just to try and make sure that, uh, we're, that it's not spread any further past that. Uh, and then we're also uh, looking at uh, the color of the wood when we clip it down there. If it's uh, like a dark kind of uh, wet looking brown, um, that's a sign that infection is already to that point. And then we'll try and prune out further to get rid of that. So I think that's all I have for uh, disease and pests or for disease pests. Uh, let's see what we have for questions. Okay, great. So a few questions. Um, one is, could you say again the name of the product which may be used for fire blight? For fire blight, um, it's a product called uh, Serenade Optimum. Serenade Optimum. It's a, a Bayer product, um, and I, I can't think of the uh, active ingredient out, off the top of my head. Okay, great. And then, um, Another one is, do you use a cover crop in the orchard and why or why not? So a uh, cover crop is, is something, I'll actually discuss that in, in the last section here when we're talking about uh, vertebrates. Uh, but yeah, uh, ground cover plays a, a huge uh, role in, in your orchard for sure. Okay, great, thanks. Um, do you have any tips for staying ahead of locusts in the orchard? You know, that's, that's not something we've ever dealt with up here. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what, what would be the best bet for that. Uh, sorry, I, I can't be of help on that one. Yeah, maybe contacting Parma. We could put the contact information for the Parma research. And, yeah, yeah, Essie and Falahi and down there in Parma is, is he, he's a, a wealth of knowledge. I'm sure he would have something for you. Okay, we'll put that into the link, a great, a great connection for our Southern Idaho or more Definitely. participants. Okay, a question about pine saw. Um, if you're using pine saw, would you use it at 100% to disinfect without dilution? Yeah, so the, the what I've seen is pine saw and Lysol are being used at 100% and, uh, and they have a very high uh, or, or they very low infection rate when they're being used. Uh, I've been told that Lysol is bad because then you smell like Band-Aids all day, though. <laughs> okay. And what varieties do you know of that are prone to fire blight? Uh, shoot. Um, off the top of my head, um, I know uh, Grimes Golden is, is supposed to be pretty uh, prone. Um, shoot. Was it, uh, I think, Spy Gold? Uh, which is uh, a northern spy cross with a golden delicious. Um, I know the spy gold is prone, so I, I would guess that uh, the golden delicious and northern spy would also be prone. Uh, but there's there's definitely uh, if you just did a, a search of uh, of uh, fire blight resistant trees, or uh, I'm sure you'd get a, a list that would give you a, a lot of options. Great, thank you. And is fire blight something that you'll see in multiple kinds of fruit trees or is it confined to specific species? Uh, apple and pear are, are, are the ones we're really watching. Um, uh, and, and pear, uh, I think pear, it's, it's the Bartlett that's uh, extremely prone uh, to fire blight. So uh, I've read that you're not supposed to 
plant a Bartlett within 100 yards of, of your other pairs, just in case that Bartlett does get it, it's not spreading it to your others. Yeah. I've seen uh, that at the WSU organic farm in their orchard, they're having some challenges with fire blight. Yeah, it, it's a tough one. And just not much in organics you can use for it. Yeah, lots of pruning. And yes, like yeah, that, hard um, pruning. Right, and so I'm, I'm guessing because you mentioned burning the the prune the clippings from the pruning that you'll need to be careful about those if you're going to dispose of them in a way other than burning in terms of yeah yeah for sure um we we all we have a, a burn site here on on site and uh and we usually try and do a a big burn in the spring so uh, we usually time that for right after we're done pruning so we're able to get rid of any of that uh, disease uh, or pest inoculum that that are in our prunings there. Yeah. So if you're doing on-farm composting, you definitely need to be making sure that you're monitoring the temperatures so that you're actually killing that bacteria that you're monitoring your piles. Otherwise, the kind of stack and let sit is not a good option. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. We try and try and get rid of that pretty quick. Okay, great. And then one last question. Do you know what causes black trunk on a live cherry tree? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I would assume that it, it's going to be uh, a, a fungus similar to uh, the, the black rot that we see in apples and pear trees. Um, so my guess would be it would be a, a, salt or a sulfur or a copper spray uh, is going to be your best bet for controlling that. I think that would be another good option to contact Parma, the Parma yeah. Surgeon Extension Station about cherries because a lot of cherries are grown in that Emmett area. So they'll be able to help you diagnose. Okay, those are all the questions that have come in. Thank you. All right. So moving on to the last section here, uh, it's uh, our, our vertebrate press. Uh, they're, they're some of the hardest to deal with and some of the easiest to deal with. Uh, the, the deer family uh, is, is going to do damage if you give them the opportunity. Uh, so uh, if you're investing in fruit trees, I, I, would, if, I, I would hope uh, to invest in a fence to, to keep those guys out of there. Um, but uh, you can also just do individual cages around trees um, and, and that'll help. Um, the, 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 bigger, the bigger guys, the moose and the elk, as you can see in this top right picture, it's not just rubbing on trees that that's causing them damage. Um, they actually gnaw off the uh, the living cambial layer of the bark. Um, we actually just did a uh, a webinar uh, with a uh, an orchard manager in Stahican, uh, Washington. Uh, it's an old Buckner uh, the Buckner Orchard in the North Cascades National Park, and uh, she has a lot of damage uh, like this from elk. And she's doing all types of creative grafting to uh, to try and preserve some of those old trees. I think that orchard was planted in the 1920s, so lot, lots of history in that one. Um, so yeah, big thing with with the deer family is is exclusion. Just try and keep them away from your trees as, as best as possible. Uh, birds are are a difficult one to deal with. Um, mostly worried about uh, your your soft fruits, your cherries, or if you have uh, other berries, raspberries, that kind of thing. Uh, the birds are a tough one. Uh, we've uh, tried uh, several different types of, of netting systems. Um, we've done uh, where we're just draping the the netting over the tree, uh, but that's that's not great for the, the form of the tree because uh, through your, your, you have it netted through its active growing season. So all of its shoots are growing out through the netting uh, and you're getting some very unusual uh, direction and, and shapes from your new growth. Um, so that, that's a kind of a tough one. Um, we've done like, uh, we've taken some big long poles and made like a, a teepee to go around the canopy of the tree. Uh, that seemed to work pretty well, but it was a, a big, uh, big undertaking for us. Um, and then uh, another thing we, we've actually built uh, like uh, square PVC cube frames uh, to go around entire trees. And then we net that box. Um, and it's another one, it, it worked, but uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's labor intensive, takes a lot of time and, uh, and material to do that. Um, 
larger orchards have have netting systems that just go over their entire block of, of cherries so they can avoid that. Um, there's also uh, orchards that use uh, uh, like uh, air cannons to to just make noise to spook the animal or the birds. I've seen there's a, a new system out that uses lasers to to target birds to deter them. Um, so there's there's all kinds of stuff out there, but it, it is a, a tough one for for a, a small producer or home orchard to uh, to keep those birds out of your cherry trees. Um, but but whatever you can do with netting uh, is going to be better than nothing for sure. And then uh, large rodents is uh, is another one that uh, we don't deal with too much. We have a, a pretty secure fence up here. Uh, but uh, the, the rabbits, you can see this damage in the bottom right is, is either a rabbit or possibly a, a porcupine. Uh, they tend to do that type of damage up under the branches as well uh, when the snow gets high enough that they can reach up there easily. Um, uh, beavers, if, if you have a beaver problem, you might want to look at something other than apple trees to plant because uh, that young tender tree is, uh, is a perfect uh, dessert for them after they've been gnawing on a big hardwood. Um, so then uh, some of our major pests uh, for vertebrates um, are the biggest thing we deal with is, is voles. Uh, metal voles is what we have up here. Um, I, I, this picture in the top right makes them look so nice and innocent, but they are not. They will do a lot of damage to a lot of young trees. Um, so the damage uh, that you're used to seeing in your yard, those, those trails where they're burrowing just along the uh, kind of the soil snow interface, uh, those, those are voles doing that kind of damage. Um, and that, that doesn't bother me so much. It's uh, when they do this damage in the bottom right corner that, uh, that I'm, I'm plotting against them. Um, so uh, the voles, uh, they're uh, pretty short lived, but they produce reproduce like crazy. So uh, the, the entire lifespan is just three to six months, but the females become sexually mature in less than two weeks. And then their gestation period can be less than two weeks or around two weeks. So you're, you're looking at uh, any female out of a litter is ready to have her own litter in about a month, which the numbers can just explode. Um, at, uh, at eight or five to eight voles per litter and a female having two to five litters in less than six months, uh, you can just see how those numbers just grow exponentially. Um, so it's, it's a tough one for us to control. Uh, being certified organic, we can't use any uh, baits or poisons. Um, so that's a, a really tough thing for us. Um, we do some mechanical trapping. Uh, there's the uh, pincher style, uh, like gopher type traps, uh, they work pretty well for them. Um, but, but it does take some time to figure out how to uh, trap these guys well. Um, what we're usually doing is, uh, is we're looking for a, a new, uh, like a new tunnel entrance. Uh, and then we are usually using a, a metal prod to find, uh, to prod the soil around that hole to figure out where their active tunnel is. And then we'll excavate that tunnel uh, and hopefully we will be seeing a tunnel going in both directions so that we can put a trap going in each direction on that uh, trail, uh, that, that tunnel. And, uh, and then from there, uh, we try and cover it up with a piece of plywood or something just uh, so that they don't see any light coming in there um, because they're going to know something's up if, uh, if they're seeing some light getting down into their, uh, their, their tunnel system. And uh, some, some of the things that we use um, for, for controls in our orchard, uh, hardware cloth is a big one. So uh, if you're familiar with hardware cloth, it's, uh, it's a mesh, uh, galvanized mesh netting uh, that uh, you can get in quarter inch or uh, eighth inch grid. Um, I tend to like the eighth inch grid. It's uh, quite a bit more pliable uh, where you can squeeze it right trunk or tight on the trunk. Um, you don't want to have it loosely just wrapped around the, the trunk because they'll climb right up behind there and do all their damage inside there. So uh, you have to have it pretty tight to the trunk. Uh, we're mostly worried about this damage uh, occurring uh, late fall through early spring. Uh, so uh, late fall, uh, what we'll do is go around and, and squeeze all the, uh, the, that hardware cloth tight to the trunks. And then in the spring, uh, after we've done our pruning and everything, we'll go through 
and we'll loosen that up just so we're not restricting growth of the trunk there. Um, ground covers was a, a question we had uh, during the last uh, little session there. And uh, ground cover is, uh, is going to play a huge role, uh, especially uh, with your vertebrate press, pests. Um, so they, they tend to, uh, they, they don't like being out in the open. They're, they're the prey species of a lot of different predators. So they like being hidden as much as possible. So by keeping a ground cover that's short, uh, that they're not going to be able to hide in is, is a, a big thing as well. Um, something that we do at the base of all of our trees is uh, we'll uh, get rid of our, our ground covers under there and we'll actually put in uh, about a, a three foot diameter ring of uh, pea gravel around the base of the trees. Um, and this does a few different things. Uh, first, it's easy to pull any annual weeds that come up uh, out of that uh, the pea gravel because it's so loose. Um, having it so that uh, there's there's a, a open area around the base of the tree uh, makes an area that voles don't want to hang out. They, they like being protected. So if you have a bunch of tall grass around the base of your tree, that's when you're going to see uh, some vole damage in there. Uh, and then the other thing uh, it can help with is uh, these voles, uh, their tunnels are, are pretty close to the surface. They tend to only be like two to three inches uh, below the soil surface. So by having about three inches or so of pea gravel around the base of the trees, uh, they can burrow to that, but as soon as they try, burrow, try burrowing into it, it's collapsing on them. So they can't have established trails going right to the trunk of that tree. Um, so, so that's a couple of the things that, uh, or a couple of the things we do around the base of the trees for, uh, uh, to, to prevent a lot of feeding. Um, another thing we do is we try to encourage uh, predators to, to get in there. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, large perches uh, for raptors out in the orchard. Um, and uh, as the snow is thawing now, uh, we're looking at the base of these uh, tall raptor poles and there's uh, owl pellets speckled all around the base of it. So it, it's cool to see that uh, the predators are actually using it. Uh, we see quite a bit of uh, red-tailed hawks hanging out there during the day as well. And we've seen them take, uh, take some of these pests as well, which is nice. Um, also, uh, we, we tried recruiting uh, some barn cats to live out in our orchard, uh, but uh, they, they didn't stick around. So, uh, so we're, we're hoping to find a, a good resident mouser, uh, but it sounds like getting a, a good mouser is, is tough to come by. So, so hopefully we'll, we'll get a good mouser out here eventually. And uh, then pocket gophers. This is the other uh, major vertebrate uh, pest that we deal with out in the orchard. These guys are a little uglier than the voles. They have those uh, yellow, orange uh, buck teeth out there. They have uh, larger uh, claws that they're doing their digging with. Um, and, uh, and they're doing a different kind of damage. They're not the ones that are girdling uh, at, above that soil layer. They're the ones that are eating all of your roots uh, off, uh, all the fibrous roots off of your main roots uh, underground. So this is one that, uh, that got hit out in our orchard, but you can see how uh, all the fibrous roots have just been gnawed down to the, the hard uh, inner wood of the root system. So then uh, what, what you'll see sometimes is as soon as the ground thaws uh, with all those roots gone, you'll see them tip over. Um, that's, uh, that's usually a sign that you've had uh, some, some pocket gopher damage. Um, other times uh, they'll, they'll come out nice and green in the spring and uh, then as soon as the weather starts to heat up, uh, you'll see these young trees start to, uh, start to uh, decline pretty quickly. And that's because they had enough uh, energy reserved in their root system and trunk for that initial burst, but then they're trying to keep up with, uh, with the, the evaporation and respiration and the root system just isn't there to support the whole tree. So you'll see those guys decline usually uh, when it starts to heat up a little bit. Uh, so these guys are uh, longer lived. Um, they'll live up to three years, but they don't become sexually mature for, uh, for the first year. Uh, and then the females tend to only have uh, one to two litters per year uh, for the next couple of years until they uh, are usually on their way out. Um, in that five to eight uh, pups per litter, um, but uh, the, the pocket gophers uh, are solitary. They're, they're territorial compared to the uh, voles. 
So uh, usually pretty quickly after uh, the, the, the pups are weaned, uh, they'll uh, go off and, and start uh, their own um, their own tunnel system. Um, a lot of the times they're, uh, they'll find old tunnel systems that uh, have been abandoned by a, a previous uh, gopher or something like that where they're, they're not able or they don't need to create their whole system on their own, which is one of the reasons why they can move uh, across a landscape pretty quickly if uh, those burrows uh, are still there and, and available for them to use. Um, so something that we, we do a lot of trapping out in our orchard, um, the, the mole or the pocket gopher uh, mounds are going to be quite a bit bigger uh, than, the, uh, than the voles, uh, but it's, you're, you're looking for that same thing. We're using a, a prod to, to plunge around the tree uh, or the, the hole to see where that uh, main, uh, main tunnel is as uh, where they're bringing that, excavating that soil out, that'll usually be plugged with a soil plug. Um, and then same thing, we're trying to set traps in both directions and uh, then cover it up so we're not letting any light down in there. Um, some people have used underground barriers where they're actually uh, digging in a, a fence uh, underground of, of mesh around their young trees. Um, it, this might be reasonable on a, a small scale if you're just doing a few trees, but on a large scale, that, that just isn't something that's feasible. Um, so uh, we're, we're mostly using trapping or, or cultural practices, and uh, this is similar to the voles where we're trying to keep our ground cover low, uh, especially close by the trees. Um, it, it's kind of a delicate balance. Uh, we're, we have a, a, a mixed legume uh, ground cover in our orchard that has various types of uh, clovers and vetch and, uh, and some alfalfa in it. Um, but uh, we're, we're trying to get the, the uh, nitrogen fixation out of those, but it's also uh, one of uh, the, the voles and gophers' uh, favorite treats. So we try and keep that tall growth uh, near the middle of our aisles away from our tree rows. Um, but uh, I think what we'd like to do is do some trials in the orchard where uh, some rows are converted to uh, just a short uh, fescue of some kind uh, just to see if, uh, if that really helps with uh, deterring uh, the, the pocket gophers and bull population. So I think that's all I have on vertebrate press. Do we have any questions on those? We just had a couple of questions that came in. One was how high up on the trunk do you place the hardware cloth? So uh, when we started doing this, uh, we were using uh, 36 inch hardware cloth and we would cut it in half. So we would be doing 18 inches up the trunk and we'll try and uh, settle that down uh, into the soil a little bit right at the root crown. Uh, but when we had that 18 uh, inches up there, uh, we had a winter where we had uh, 24 inches of snow out there most of the year. And it turns out these voles would climb right up the hardware cloth and they girdled a few trees 18 inches off the ground. Uh, so since then we've moved to uh, 24 inches of hardware cloth. Um, but uh, that's not to say when we have 30 inches of snow, they're not going to climb right up above that. So we're just hoping they're afraid of heights. <laughs> All right, thanks. And then uh, one additional question, is human scent an issue for mechanical trapping? Um, it, it, we, we don't go overboard or boil our traps or anything like that. Um, you might have better uh, success if, if you do, but it's just not something that we undertake. I, I know with, uh, with traditional trapping, uh, like hunting trapping, uh, they're always doing a lot to control the scent, uh, but it, it, uh, it seems like we, we still catch quite a bit of them even uh, without doing any of that. Great, thank you. Those are all the questions that we had. Cool. Well, I think uh, unless there were any other questions on anything else, I think that was all I had. Okay, great. We'll make sure to put the WSU and um, the U of I websites into your slide deck, and we'll add those couple of other pictures when you send them to us so everybody can find those in the handout that will be posted on the Cultivating Success website. So I'm going to just share a couple of last slides. And thank you again, Kyle, for that presentation. It was really great. There is an evaluation of today's webinar that we would appreciate your feedback. It will 
um, it will appear automatically in your browser at the end of this webinar. You will also get a reminder tomorrow. Please let us know um, what you learned and how you might use that information, as well as letting us know what other information would you like to have. As you can see, we have all of our webinars on the Cultivating Success website at Recorded Webinars. Upcoming webinars, we have one additional pest management webinar this month, and that's going to be March 30th, next Tuesday on white rot in garlic. And then our April theme is going to transition into looking again at marketing, where we'll be looking at using open food marketplace, designing your farmer's market booth, and then moving into looking at some digital information and land access. So thank you again, Kyle, for being our presenter today, for our participants, for uh, participating in today's webinar and for your questions. We look forward to having you on another Cultivating Success webinar in the future. Have a really great day. Thanks for having me. Goodbye, everyone.